Good morning, everybody. It is great to be with you today. I bring greetings from the Tahoe family encampment and all of the uh, uh, the Christians who are gathered there. Uh, if you don't have anything planned next year uh, in July, I believe it's July 12th through the 16th, uh, you might want to come out and join us. Uh, basically, what it is is uh, uh, churches from California and Washington and Arizona and Nevada all gathered together there at Lake Tahoe camp out for the week. Uh, hear some lessons about uh, Christ uh, around some theme of Christianity. Uh, and try to encourage one another. And it was a great time. We had a blast. Uh, if there was only one thing I wish that was different is somebody forgot to turn up the heat. It was 38 degrees, and it's been a minute since I've been in that cold. So uh, I have gotten more used to the surface of the sun than the surface of the moon. Uh, but we made it through. It was great. It is great to be back with you. I want to make sure to thank uh, Brother Parks for filling in while I was gone. It is great to see all of your smiling faces. You're probably well aware by now that throughout the year of 2024, we are attempting to focus and emphasize fellowship. For fellowship is joining in God's redemptive plan. And it includes the way that we grow our relationship together, uh, but it extends beyond that. It's the way that we join God in not only strengthening the church, but in taking the gospel throughout the entire world. And one of the ways that we're attempting to focus upon this is by reading texts together throughout the year that talk in terms or emphasize an aspect of fellowship. And this month it's James chapter 2, verses 14 through 17. Now let's read that text together. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. When you think in terms of a godly leader, what comes to mind? Who do you think of? One of the per first person, one of the first people that I think of is Joshua. If you got your Bibles, we're going to look at Joshua chapter 5. Joshua chapter 5. I want us to look at verses 13 through 15. But before we do, I want to set up what seems to be taking place. Uh, Joshua is outside of Jericho, and the text doesn't say exactly what he's doing. But because he's a general and because he's, he's a well-seasoned warrior, I think we can make a little bit of an educated guess uh, that he seems to be perhaps thinking about what is to come with the battle of Jericho that is imminent. Uh, perhaps that evening he takes time to walk around and imagine what possible strategies might they engage upon. But it, but at least begins to think about the challenge that is before them. In the midst of his thought, there at night, as he walks by himself, contemplating what is to come, out of the darkness steps a figure with his sword drawn. And that's where we pick up in verse 13. When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes, and behold, a man was standing before him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, No. But I am the commander of the army of the Lord, and now I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. A figure steps out from the dark with his sword drawn. And in my mind's eye, I see Joshua, this well-seasoned warrior, this, this general of Israel's armies. And I see him take a step back and assume a defensive position, grabbing for his sword, prepared to do battle. But before he rips it from his sheath, he asks an all-important question. Are you for us or for our enemies? Are we to get together and be friends or are we about to do battle? And notice the, the, the response that he gets. It's a response that almost seems to indicate that the concerns of men are beneath him. Because it's just, no. No, but I am a commander of the Lord's army. And notice the change in Joshua. From ready to do battles, grasping his sword, to on his knees before this individual. It's a beautiful picture of what godly leadership is. What it 
should be. For godly leaders, we need godly leaders who are ready to stand up and protect those who depend upon them, who are ready to fight for the causes of God, who are ready to stand firm in what they believe, but who are humble and on their knees before God. This morning, we're going to talk in terms of not being ashamed to lead the church. Now, we could talk about the reality that there's a sense in which all of us are leaders. Uh, for we are, are we not all to lead somebody to Christ? Is that not to be our goal, or at least one of our goals, to, to try and bring as many people to heaven as we possibly can with us to lead others towards a relationship with Christ? And are we not to try and, and live lives that others might follow, uh, to, try and, to try and emulate what Paul said, to, to follow me as I follow Christ? And so there's a sense in which all of us are leaders, for all of us are leading someone. Uh, the only question is, who are we leading and how? But all of us, there's a sense in which all of us are leaders. And so we could talk about that this morning. But instead, this morning I want us to focus upon those, those roles of leadership. You know, elders, deacons, ministers. Now, each of those have different levels of authority and different roles and different types of leadership. Uh, and yet all three, there's a sense in which all three do lead. For elders are called to be the shepherds of the church. Uh, they have the authority given by God to help direct the church, and then their task is to help shepherd the sheep of God towards heaven, and they are given the leadership and the authority to do so. We have ministers uh, whose task is to preach the word, to repre reprove, rebuke, and exhort. Uh, and in that task, there's, there's an element of authority and an element of leadership, though different from that of elders and not the same type of authority. And then we have deacons who don't have the same authority as elders or ministers, but whose task is to, through their servant leadership, through their servant attitude, they help to lead the church and set an example of that hopefully we can follow towards God. It's no secret that we need more ministers. We need more elders. We need more deacons. For throughout the church, this morning, throughout the church, throughout the world, that there are pulpits that are empty because there is no preacher to fill them. And we need more preachers who will boldly stand and preach the word of God. And it's no secret that we need more elders. For throughout the church, throughout the world, there, there's a need for godly men who will help defend the church, help guide the church, and help protect the church so that we all might get to heaven together. We have a need for servant leaders, for, for deacons. And this morning, I want us to look at and to encourage us to be willing to consider being leaders. Whenever we ask the question, uh, whenever, or I should say, one of the responses that we sometimes hear as to why men might not be willing to take on the role of elder, deacon, or minister is that they don't have the desire. And I found myself wondering, what is meant by that? That I don't have the desire. Perhaps, perhaps they're referring to the demand that leadership requires. And there certainly is a demand. There's a demand on time. Uh, there's the requirement of sacrifice. Sometimes it's a sacrifice of time. Uh, sometimes it's a sacrifice because of loss of sleep, staying up late at night, thinking uh, about the challenges that are being faced and where, uh, what, what might be needed and where we might need to go. Sometimes it might be the sacrifice of some family time. So, so there are demands in leadership, and we don't want to minimize them. But if we focus purely upon the demand, we perhaps miss the blessing. I want you to take a moment and imagine with me, think with me. I want you to imagine the face of a leader in the church, an elder, a deacon, a minister, someone who has impacted your relationship with uh, perhaps this is an individual who came and sat with you there at the hospital, uh, sat with you while your loved one uh, was going through surgery and prayed with you, and the impact they had upon your life was great. Or perhaps it's someone who, in the midst of a dark time in life, was there to encourage you and pray with you. Or maybe it was through their example, through the way that they lived, that they encouraged you to live a better life and to live more like
leadership has a duty. It also has a great blessing. For as leaders in the church, we have this opportunity to be an eternal blessing to those who are around us. We don't want to minimize the great blessing that uh, that is, not, not only in the lives of others, but in our own lives as well, as we have this opportunity to be an eternal blessing to those with whom we have the privilege of working with. So perhaps, uh, perhaps people think in terms of the demand when they think of life in Mount Zion. But I wonder if that minimizes the blessing. Or, or perhaps it's perhaps it's not the demand that they think of, but rather it's the challenge of dealing with certainly, dealing with people can be challenging, for it turns out that nobody's perfect. But there is no perfect church. Why would there be? We are a family, and every family has its challenges. Every family has its moments of difficulty, its moments of friction. It's just part of being family. And there is no perfect church, and well, quite frankly, if there was, none of us could be there. Working with people can be challenging. It can be difficult. But if we only focus upon the challenge, we might very well miss the reality that in leadership we have the opportunity to work with and serve the greatest people on the planet. Last Thanksgiving, we flew from Phoenix to Nashville to visit, well, Phoenix to Nashville and by car to Kentucky to visit my family. We had a great time with them, and then on our way back, we flew into Sky Harbor, and as we were making our way out to the East Economy Life lot to pick up our car, as we were walk, walking along, it was getting late in the day, and Manny asked a question. Dad, do you think somebody stole our car? I thought, of all the questions to ask right now, why would you put that in my head? Do you think somebody stole our car? I said, well, you know, I don't, I don't know, son. I guess we'll have to see. He said, well, what would we do? What, what would we do if somebody stole our car? I thought, why are you putting this in my head? I don't need this right now. I don't know, son. I, I guess we'd figure it out. Okay. We walked along for a little bit longer, and he said, you know, I, I guess it'd be all right. You know, because we could call some of our family at Surprise, and they'd come, they'd come get us and take care of us. Out of the mouth of babes. For we are a family. And here at Surprise, we love one another, and we take care of one another. If somebody has a need, we make sure it's met. Why? Because we're family and we love one another. That's the way the church is. That, yes, the church is full of people, and we're not perfect, and we don't always get along, we don't always act as we should, but, we are the, but the church is the best people on the face of the earth, the best people on the planet. And, yes, there are challenges. But if we only focus upon the challenges, we miss the reality of the great privilege and opportunity that we have in leadership to work with God's people. So perhaps, perhaps it is one of those two that is meant when someone says that they don't have the desire. Perhaps they are thinking about the demand, or perhaps they are thinking about the challenge of working with people. But I have this suspicion. I have this suspicion that it's it's really something a little bit deeper. A deep-seated reservation. Because of one of two things. And I want us to spend the rest of our time today focusing upon these two reservations that I suspect individuals have as to why they might not get into leadership. And it just so happens that these are the two challenges that every leader faces within, within their time as a leader. And the first, the first is being ashamed of their limitations. If you've got your Bibles, we're going to look at the story of Gideon in Judges. Judges chapter 6, and I want us to look beginning in verse 11. Judges chapter 6, beginning in verse 11. Now before we read this, uh, Israel has once again done uh, succumbed to the pattern of Judges. And that is, there's this tendency to uh, follow God for a little bit and then cease doing what God had told them to do, what he commanded them to do. And the result was that God allowed them to be taken over and, and subjected to some foreign power. And once again, Israel has done that. And so as a result, for the last seven years, the Midianites have ravaged Israel. And we pick up in verse 11. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash, Joash the Ab Abizarite, while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. 
And Gideon said to him, Hey, sir, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do not I send you? And he said to him, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, But I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. Every time I read this text, I find myself wondering, what was Gideon's face like? How did he react? What did he look like? How did his voice sound when this angel came to him and said, O oh, mighty man of valor, O oh, mighty man of valor who's currently hiding in a cave because he doesn't want to be found. Uh, oh, mighty man of valor who is the weakest of the weakest of the weakest of the weak. Oh, mighty man of valor. And I wonder if he didn't just kind of look around for a moment. Talk to me. And notice how he responds. Please, Lord. Now, I suspect that this wasn't the Oliver, tri- Oliver Twist. Please, can I have some all? But rather more of a please. Please, are you kidding me? I am the weakest of the weakest. Can you not see that I'm hiding in a cave? Oh, mighty man of valor, my foot. But notice that three times what the angel says. And there's this principle in Scripture that any time that God repeats himself, it's worth paying attention to, for he doesn't repeat himself very often. And when he does, it means that it's important. Notice there in verse 12. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, The Lord is with you. And there in verse 14, Do not I send you? In verse 16, the Lord said to him, But I will be with you. You see, it was never about Gideon's power and strength, but rather about the power and the strength of the one who would be with him. Throughout Scripture we see this pattern, that God has a tendency of picking individuals who don't necessarily make sense. Individuals who seem to be the least qualified for the role that he's setting them up for. For example, Moses is picked. The the, the one who cannot speak well is picked to be the mouthpiece of Israel. The one who would give the law. Abraham. The one without children is picked to be the father of faith. And that over and over again we see God pick individuals who seem to be the least likely Not because of their power, but because of his. It's the very reason that God spoke to Paul. For you may recall that Paul had this thorn in the flesh. This challenge, we don't don't exactly know what it was, but this this challenge that inhibited his ability, at least what he perceived to be his ability, to do what he was supposed to do. And you remember what God told him. My grace is sufficient for you. not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. It's never been about our power and our ability, but rather it's always been about the one who has all power and our ability to trust in him. We need leaders. We need leaders who have learned that that it's not about their ability, but rather their willingness to allow the power of God to work through them. For every leader faces moments of the feelings of inadequacy. And those aren't bad. For feelings of inadequacy just means that, that we care means that that we recognize the challenge that we face and that we care about it, that that we care about God's people and we care about God and we want to do right by both. We, We need leaders who recognize the challenge and recognize that they don't have all the answers and that they don't have all the power, but that they know the one and can trust in the one who does. We need leaders who have learned to trust.
as a church, we play a role, and we should strive to try and encourage our members. I remember hearing about the compliment sandwich. Uh, Perhaps you're familiar with it. It goes like this. Uh, If you're wanting to try and present a critique, you want to try and minimize that, the, the impact of that critique. And so you start off with a compliment. Like, I really like how you did blank. Or I really like how you usually do blank. Then there's the critique of, you know, but you could do this better. And then you finish it off with another compliment. So sandwiched in between two compliments is a critique, thus a compliment sandwich. But I've noticed that sometimes, perhaps many times, the only time we give compliments are in a compliment sandwich. And it minimizes those compliments because there's this critique in the middle of it. And so it sounds like, well, the only reason why you're telling me something good or encouraging is so that you can tell me something I could do better. Either that or we wait until people die. And then we express how much we appreciate them. Our leaders need to know how much we appreciate them. Our elders and deacons need to know how much we love them. How thankful we are of the challenges that they face. How thankful we are that they continue to try try and rely upon God. And so we need to take the time to offer encouragement, communicate our appreciation, without it being a compliment sandwich. We need leaders who recognize the challenge that they face and have learned to trust not in their own power, but in the power of God. It leads us to the second, perhaps deep-seated reason why some might say that they have no desire. And that is that they're ashamed of their past. I'm reminded of Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6, and we're going to begin in verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings, which co- with, with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, and the whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke, and I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord. Then I said, here I am, send me. So so how did Isaiah go from, woe is me, to here am I, send me? Verse 7. And he touched my mouth and said, behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned. So how did Isaiah go from, woe is me, to here am I, send me? It was the righteousness of God at work in him. The same with Peter. For Peter would utter a similar idea to Isaiah, where he would say, Get away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. And yet, this is the same Peter who later would be a rocket within the church, the one who would preach there at Pentecost, the one who would go and preach to the Gentiles. And how did he go from get away from me to being such a rock? The righteousness of God at work in him. For it's never been about about his righteousness working in us. The story is told of a man who entered a room that was filled with file cabinets. Floor to ceiling, wall to wall, filled with file cabinets. And he walked over to the cabinet and opened it and pulled out a file. And there in a file was a record of everything that he'd ever done. Everything that he'd ever said. And he looked down, and sure enough, there his name was at the bottom of this record. Concerned and 
certain that nobody should ever see this room at all or see any of the files that were within it. He went to the next file cabinet, and sure enough, it was still a file of all the things that he'd ever said and ever done, going from when he was young all the way to the present day. And every file cabinet was filled with everything he'd ever said, every lie he'd ever told, every unkind and unjust thing he'd ever done. And as he sat there staring at this file cabinet, this file before him, full of the darkest moments of his life, to his heart he heard the door open and turned, and in walks Jesus. No, Lord, please, 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 not you, not now, not with, not with all this that is set before you. And he looked at him kindly in his eyes, w- walked over to the file cabinet, uh, opened it, and took out a file. All the horrible things that had been done. She just looked at him with a kind eye. And there at the bottom, scribbled something. Put the file back in. Thanks, Lord. Thanks, Lord. As he moved to the next file cabinet, a man came over, opened it, and opened the file. And there where his name should have been, in red, was the name of Jesus. And sure enough, every single file bore the name of Jesus with his initials. Righteousness of God imputed for faith or faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. It's never been about our righteousness. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that righteousness doesn't matter. Paul deals with that in Romans chapter 6, where he says that uh, should we go on sinning that grace may abound? By no means, heaven forbid, may it never be so. For to do so is to misunderstand the righteousness of God. But but it's never been about our ability to be righteous, but rather the righteousness of God and His righteousness at work in our hearts. The truth is that we all know that to be true. We all know that Jesus has come and that He's washed away our sins and that He offers salvation and that through Him we no longer have to be ashamed of what we have done. We know that to be true. And yet, there's this struggle. Throughout Scripture, Satan is referred to as the accuser, the one who stands before God, accusing God's people. But the truth is that Satan doesn't just stand before God, accusing us in front of him. He also comes to each one of us and accuses us in our heart. A whisper whisper reminding us of all the things that we have done, all the horrible things and reasons. Matthew chapter 1, you can turn there if you want to on your own. But in Matthew chapter 1, we encounter the genealogy of Jesus. And there's this this long list, this long list of names. And you're going to recognize some of them. Uh, You would recognize David, uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. But there's a few on here that don't make sense. There's Tamar. Now, now, they don't make sense for a couple reasons. One, uh, they're women, and in this genealogy and in the time of the Jews, uh, the lineage is traced through men, so it's a little weird that there are some women in there. But if we're going to trace it through women, it's weird that Sarah's not there, because she would be one to include in your genealogy. Instead, we have the black sheep of the family. Ruth, okay, maybe. Ruth is a pretty good person overall, but she's still wasn't supposed to be there. But what about Tamar? That incestuous relationship with Judah. What about Rahab? How do you tell the grandkids about what Rahab used to do? What Grandma Rahab used to do? The wife of Uriah. So, such a black sheep, they don't even give her name. It's all the black sheep. And those black, those black spots on the family And yet, because at the end of this lineage we find Jesus Christ, because of that, we have to view these other individuals and these other moments in time differently. It doesn't make them okay. It doesn't make everything better. It doesn't take away what was done. But we're forced to view them differently because it leads up to Christ. And the same is true of those black moments in our lives. That because 
followers of Christ, we're forced to view them differently. As we, as we accept him, we're forced to view those dark moments in our lives differently, for it's no longer a testament to how unworthy we are, but of how great his grace is. but as a testament to how great the grace of God is. Sergeant Mitchell Page was a machine gunner who was assigned to a platoon in Guadalcanal. He and his platoon were tasked with defending the old, one of the few access points that would allow wheels to go over them. What that means is this. If Sergeant Page and his platoon failed to hold their position, it would allow the Japanese to easily advance upon the Allied position. It was imperative that Sergeant Page and his platoon hold their ground. One evening, the Japanese attacked unexpectedly, and Sergeant Page found himself the only machine gunner left alive for all of his fellow machine gunners had perished. Knowing the importance and the, the essentialness of maintaining their position. Under cover of darkness, all night long, Sergeant Page ran from one machine gun nest to the next, laying down fire in an attempt to confuse the enemy and fool them into thinking that there were more men than there really were. Eventually, he managed to rally what few Marines remained, picked up his Browning machine gun, firing from the hip, and led the charge back into the enemy. Because of his leadership, the Japanese attack was thwarted. We need more godly leaders who are willing to stand up and stand firm for what is right and to fight for the people of God and to lead the people of God. We need leaders who've come to rely not upon their own power, but upon the power of God. Who have come to view even their dark moments, not as a testament to how unworthy they are, but rather to a, as a testament of how stand up proudly and say, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God and righteousness to everyone who believes. Perhaps you're here today, and you want to begin a relationship with the one who loves you most, the one who sacrificed everything, and that you might begin a relationship with him. And there's nothing that would ex excite us more than to help you begin that journey which starts at baptism. Or perhaps you're here and you need the prayers of the church. If there's any way we can assist you, won't you come as together we stand and sing?